Well, growing up in school, we used to have this game that we would play as kids. And a lot of times this would be like in class, during, in between projects, or in between classwork, and the teacher would just say, hey, let's play a game. And this was an awesome thing. And she would ask for a volunteer, and a volunteer would come forward. And then what would happen would be that volunteer would say something like this. Simon says, hop on one foot. And then everybody would hop on one foot. And then they would say, Simon says, raise your right hand. And if you dropped your foot, then you were out because you didn't say stop that. And the goal of the game was to listen so clearly that you followed the directions perfectly. So if they said, hop on one foot, you hopped on one foot. If they said, stop hopping on one foot, you would stop. But every once in a while, they would say things like, Simon says, hop on one foot. And then they would say, all right, stop. And everyone who stopped hopping on one foot was out of the game. Because why? Simon didn't say. And the goal of this game was to be the last person standing at the end, who was a perfect listener, who followed the instructions to the T, and then your reward at the end, if you were the last person, was you were able to get up and lead the next game. You see, that was the goal. You had to be an exceptional listener. You had to follow instructions perfectly, and your reward was leading. A lot of times in our Christian faith, in our journey with faith, we talk a lot about following. We talk a lot about following Jesus. We talk a lot about following God's word and following his instructions. We talk a lot about the importance of being a good follower. When Jesus came to this earth, he had 12 men that he said, follow me too. But he also had a lot of other people that were following him as well. And he would say, follow me. But those four years of following Jesus were for a purpose. You see, the point of Jesus' ministry was not so much to get these guys to be awesome followers, but to train them to be great leaders. To train them up so that when their time came, they would go out and they would lead an entire movement of people, leading them to Jesus, leading them to do the things that Jesus taught them to do. So often we focus on being great followers, and that's so important Because in order to lead, you must first follow. But the point of the Christian walk is to be a leader. To lead others. When Jesus led his disciples to follow him, he taught them. He taught them by example. They followed him for four years. His words had power to forgive sins. His word had power to give sight to the blind, to make the lame walk. And he told them that it would be his words that would carry them on to be great leaders. But as many of us know, young guys aren't the best listeners. You see, when they were walking with Jesus, Jesus would say these most profound things and they would just go over their heads. Some of our wives understand how men can just let things go over their heads. But Jesus gave them a promise that later on down the road, that after he was gone and they were risen to this leadership, that the Holy Spirit would come. And John 14, 26 says, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, I think that's important because the Holy Spirit reminds them of all Jesus said doesn't necessarily remind them of all Jesus did, all the miracles, but reminds them of what Jesus taught them, what Jesus said to them, what they heard Jesus teach other people. Because the words are what is going to be so important because the words are what is going to lead the next generation of people to change the world. And throughout Christian history, we see that the key to being a great leader is to be a great listener first. Listening to God's word. But not just listening to God's word, learning to obey it. Learning that when you read this, it is important not just to be a hearer of God's word, as James 1.22 says, but to be a doer of God's word. 
learning to obey, and then, of course, probably the most important thing is teaching others to do the same. So our big idea this morning is simply three words, listen, learn, lead. For you Baptists out there, three L's should be easy to remember. Listen, learn, and lead. And all of this is a part of our journey of faith. We all start as listeners, and then we transition to learners. And what many followers of Jesus, I think, fail to do is make the last transition to leaders. We listen, we learn to obey, but we don't lead others to do the same. And that is where we miss out on the journey of faith. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we're going to go Old Testament on this. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And just a little bit of a background on Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is probably one of the most important passages in all of the Old Testament. This lays the foundation of the Jewish faith. It's quite possibly the first recorded words of a a monotheistic God where there is only one God as opposed to the many of the Egyptian world, the many of the Roman world, the many of the Greek world all the way back even long before that. This is the first kind of idea that there is but one God. And the author of the book of Deuteronomy is a man named Moses. And Moses was a great leader of the Jewish people. And God met with him face to face. And he gave him the law. And he wrote down the history starting in Genesis that God revealed to him on the mountain of God. He told the people what was expected of them, what they were supposed to do. And he gave them this great first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And here Deuteronomy is written in the twilight of Moses' life. Moses was about 120 years old by this time. Moses had lived a long life. He had led the people of Israel out of Egypt with the goal of leading them to the promised land, but the people rebelled. And God punished the older generation and says, you will never enter into the land of Israel at all. So now we have the younger generation 40 years after they left Egypt, and it's time for them to take the people of Israel in. And Moses, who is not going himself, he has some final words of instruction for them, that they are to listen, to learn, and to lead. So we pick up in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, and we're going to read a couple verses, then we're going to talk about it, and then read a couple more, and then we'll close out. So three three sections, basic around Listen, learn, and lead. So verses 1 through 3. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now the first first thing that Moses tells the Israelite people to do is to listen, to listen to instructions. Now, a word that you might see repeated throughout this section and and, and even further and even before in Deuteronomy is this word, hear. You hear it over and over again. Hear, O Israel. In a sense, you could potentially translate this word, listen. It's kind of the same idea. But I do think there there is a difference between listening and hearing. The difference is, in a sense, that when you're listening, your attention is focused on who's talking. You're listening and and focusing your attention on them. But here has the connotation that you do something with what you hear. You do something with what you're listening to. It's not just about listening, but it's about listening that leads to action. Moses says, hear, listen to what I am telling you. Listen to these commandments, listen to these rules. 
And then he goes on to say that, listen, that the Lord your God commanded me. You see, Moses didn't start out as a leader. Moses started out as a listener. He started out as a listener, listening to God. And first, Moses listens to God. He learns to obey God. And then he is qualified to lead others to do the same. So here we have Moses commanding the people, not what Moses thinks, not what, what's put on Moses' heart, but what he is teaching the people to do is exactly what God taught him to do. He's not making this stuff up. And he's saying, what I am teaching you is the same thing that God taught me. And then he says this, that you may fear the Lord your God. Now, a lot of times I think we soften this a little bit. We say that, that fearing God is more about like reverent awe. We say that God, fearing God is more about like being in awe of his majesty. But every time in scripture anybody comes face to face with God, including Moses, the first thing that they do is to be terrified. They fall down as though they are dead because coming face to face with God is that idea that you will surely die because in light of his perfections, we are so far short of that. And so often in history where we get, we, we get off track is we begin to fear other people more than we fear God. And that's where God's instructions come so far, so much more important to follow because a lot of times following God's instructions is not popular with other people. Following God's instructions is not popular, so people begin to persecute us. And they did it to Moses in Egypt. They did it to the disciples when Jesus said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. They were criticized, but Moses says, don't fear others, fear God. And what happens is the beauty that happens is every time somebody responds to God in that, that type of fear, God immediately responds with grace that you may fear the Lord your God. But not just you, your son and your son's son. So your children and your grandchildren to keep all of the commandments. Now, he doesn't list all the commandments here, but they know what they are. They know the Ten Commandments. They know that the entire book of Leviticus is full, filled with 613 laws that they're to follow on their journey with faith. They're to listen, and that's the first step. They're to listen first. Right around the holidays, one of the big things in my family is we always play board games. Anyone have board game night around the holidays? For me, I, am, I like the old school board games, the ones that I've played my whole life, like Monopoly and Risk, things like Scrabble, things that are simple. But every once in a while, somebody will show up to board game night with one of these like complicated board games that before you even start, you got to listen to the instructions for an hour before you even get started. And even once you've listened to them for an hour, you still have no idea what's going on. And people think this is fun. And I'm like, no, 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 let's just stick to the simple games. And what happens is, is that you stick to the simple games and you kind of avoid that headache. But it's important to know what you're doing before you start. Otherwise, you get into a situation where you're just like, I, I have no idea what to do next. What does the rules say? I, I don't know. Those complicated games have been known to end friendships and create family feuds. Of course, Monopoly has done that as well. And let's face it, in Monopoly, it's everybody makes up their own rules anyway. Which rules, you know, can you, you know, free parking or, or whatever? I, I don't know. You know how it is. You just make up rules as you go, and then everybody's like, wait, wait, that's not a rule, house rules. But here's the truth, is a lot of these games have complicated rules. And the truth is, when we come to God's word, it really isn't all that complicated. It really isn't all that complicated. It's pretty straightforward, and if we just read it, if we listen to it, we can very, in a very real way learn to obey it. God's rules are very simple, and we'll get to that in a minute. But 
What Moses is telling us is that these rules are important. God's word is important for us to listen to. To listen to first. To hear what it is that it's trying to teach us. Now, nobody's perfect. Nobody's going to keep the, the rules perfectly. Nobody is going to end up in heaven one day and, and is going to be said, you didn't break a single one of the rules. All the instructions you kept, in fact, even Moses, the reason he's not allowed to go into the promised land is because he broke one of God's rules and God said, you cannot lead the people to go. That's one of the reasons why he is giving the instructions now. But he's telling them, make sure you are paying attention to God's words. Make sure you're listening, make sure you're heeding them, and make sure that you take it very seriously. Which kind of brings us to our day, because how often is it when we come to this book that we come with our own agenda? We read it and we kind of want to pick and choose some things that we want to, we want to like. We like passages like Jeremiah 29, 11 that talks about the great plans God has for us. We talk about how I can do all things who, through Christ who strengthens me. And we think, what a great passage for a coffee cup. But then we get to passages like from Jesus where he says, anyone who would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. It's a little bit harder for us to take. A lot of times we come to this and we kind of want to find some justification for what we've already had planned. We want to pick and choose some passages or kind of do one of these where we're like, God, show me your will. And the reality is, is that we are to heed these instructions, to take them very seriously and to read them and to become acquainted with them so that when our time comes that we need them, we are ready to put them into practice. We shouldn't go looking for loopholes. We shouldn't go looking for, for that magic formula for God to make us rich and answer all of our prayers and make sure we're healthy, but we should look at it as a way to be obedient. When we approach God's Word, do we approach it so as we would learn to obey it? Or is it we just kind of want to figure out how to get from God what it is that we want to get? Let's keep reading. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. The next thing we need to do is learn to obey. We need to learn to obey what it is that we read. Now, as the Israelites in this story learned pretty quickly, there is a, a very big difference between knowing God's word, listening to God's word, hearing God's word, and actually following God's word, actually being obedient to what God wants us to do. You see, they did go over into the promised land, and for that first generation, things seemed to go really well, but they failed to pass it on to their sons and their sons' sons. You see, what wound up happening was they began to stray. They began to worship other gods. They began to worship false gods to sacrifice to them the same gods that they were called to destroy when they got into the land. They didn't even last one generation before they entered into this cycle of sinning, rebellion, God's discipline, them repenting, turning back to God, God blessing them, things going well, then them sinning again, and the cycle continued for hundreds of years. They failed to learn to obey what was written. And like I said, it's very simple. It's not like these things are simple. Verse 4, this is one of the most important verses in all of the Old Testament. The Hebrew kids understood this as the Shema. If you've ever been to a bar mitzvah, you probably have heard this. It's the Shema. Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. God is one. And why is that so important? Because all around them, 
are these people worshiping many gods. There's this polytheistic society where you are so afraid of offending anybody that any time you think of something, you elevate it as a god. Gods of the earth, gods of the wind, gods of fire, gods of death, gods of life. The very first thing God says is there is but one God and you are to worship him alone and that God is me. Hear, O Lord. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. That's the first thing. Don't worship anyone but the one true God. The second thing is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You see, that's so important. Otherwise, it's just legalism. You see, when we approach God's word and we approach his instructions, there's two ways that we can approach this. We can say, well, I'm going to do this out of obligation. I'm just going to obey this because, you know, I, I, I'm obligated to do it. Or you're going to obey it out of love for God. And for me, I've always found that love is a much greater motivator than obligation. Think about that with your relationships with other people. Think about it if you're married. Think about it if you have kids or you have parents. If your wife or your husband asks you to do something, and you say, well, I don't want to, but I'm just going to do it out of obligation. How are they going to feel? But the reality is, is that when we love that person, a lot of times we can actually anticipate what they ask us to do before we even do it. So when you see dishes piled up in the sink, you don't have to wait for your wife to say, hey, can you do the dishes? You can just do them. Love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being. It's not enough to just obey God. God wants your love. And then this last thing. And these words that I command you shall be on your heart. You see, how do you get the words of God on your heart? How do you get them written on your heart? Well, it means that we actually are intimately acquainted with his word, that we're reading it, that we're memorizing it, that we're internalizing it. That when life happens, that we're able to bring to mind Scripture. Thinking about when Jesus came to earth and that story of him being led into the desert by the devil to be tempted. And every time he was tempted, how did Jesus respond but quoting the Word of God? We quote the Word of God into our life so that it is the center of every fiber of our being. For the Israelites in this time, they were going to find themselves quickly without their leader, without Moses, the man who had delivered them out of the land of Egypt, who had raised them up, who had led them through the wilderness, and who had been their primary teacher. And now they would be without him. And essentially he wants them to know, hey, remember your training. Remember what it is that you were training for. You see, in the military or the police force, all of these people, they go through training, deep training, to make sure that when they get out into a war, that they are prepared. You see, they train and they drill even in peacetime so that when the war comes, they're ready. When the war comes, when they go out and they're scared, they just remember their training and their training will kick in. And a lot of times I think for us, the hardest time for us to be in God's word, to be close to God, is when things are going great. When all our bills are paid, when there's food on the table, when the car is running great, when life is just awesome. But that's when we neglect the scriptures. That's when we neglect reading it. That's when we neglect learning to obey it. And before we know it, we find ourselves in these situations where life just falls apart. And you think about what happened up in Paradise, California, where one night they're just having dinner, and then the next thing you know, the entire town is gone. Are you prepared for something like that? Or do you live in this world where we believe that so long as we're faithful to God, nothing ever bad will happen to us? The truth is that we know that bad things happen to followers of Jesus. In fact, we're promised that bad things will happen. 
But the other promise is that God will be with us. And the way that God is with us is by, like what Jesus said to his disciples, the Holy Spirit will bring to mind his word to give us strength to carry on. But before that happens, let us learn to obey God's word. Remember your training. Remember what it is that you were learning to do. For followers of Jesus, we have a lifetime to learn what it means to follow Jesus better. We have a lifetime to get closer to him, to draw nearer to him. Listening implies that you're listening to his word, to reading it, embracing it. But there are some things in this that you might like. There are some things you might not like. Hearing implies that you take what you're learning and you're putting it into practice, but not just the things that you like. But when you come to those passages, you're like, I don't like that. I don't want to believe that that happened, because guess what's going to happen? In a couple books, when Joshua marches the people into the promised land, there's going to be a lot of war. There's going to be a lot of rough stories. Is your faith strong enough to endure some of the rough things of the word of God. And this is where we find Moses. Spent a lifetime of listening to God and learning to obey him, not getting everything perfect, but living a life that even after he died, the Bible tells us that there was no greater prophet than him all the way up to the coming of Jesus. Moses listened to God. He learned to obey God, but he took it a step further and he led others to do the same. Moses was a father, but like, unlike many of the stories that we hear, Moses didn't just kind of pass this on to his eldest son. See, a lot of times in life, you know, we, we go on the coattails of our father. You would have thought that Moses' older son was being groomed to take over the leading of the people of Israel, but that's not what happened at all. You see, Moses kind of had a spiritual adopted son and his name was Joshua. And for many years, Moses was preparing Joshua to lead his people into the promised land. Moses was teaching him. Joshua was listening. Joshua was learning to obey so that when his time came, he would be ready to lead. And the instructions were clear. Go and multiply. So let's finish out this section. Verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, one of the most important things that we can do as followers of Jesus is to lead others to Jesus as well. And that was the third thing. Lead others to do the same. Listen to God's instructions. Learn to obey. And then lead others to do the same. You see, Moses modeled this in his life. He modeled this so that other people would look at him and they would be able to do what Moses did. There was this story where Moses' father-in-law was rebuking Moses for hearing every single case that was brought before him, every single complaint. And Moses' father-in-law said, Moses, you are going to kill yourself if you continue to do this. Rise up other people that can lead the way you're leading. Over hundreds and fifties and twenty-fives, make sure that they are doing what you're doing. Model so that they can follow. Lead others. And I think it goes without saying that what Moses is talking about is the next generation here. Lead the next generation to do the same. And this is exactly what they didn't do. They didn't rise up the next generation, teach them to listen, teach them to obey, which is why when it came time for them to lead, they just completely walked away. But here's what I want us to understand here. When we read this, I think a lot of us read this as being parents. If you're a a father or a mother, you read this and you say, okay, verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children 
And I think many of us, we stop there and we say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on my children. I'm going to focus only on my kids. But we got to recognize that this wasn't written to individual mothers and fathers. This was written to a nation. So when he says, your children, he's not talking about your individual children. He's talking about the collective children of a generation. And each generation is responsible for the next generation. Each generation is responsible to lead the next generation, to teach them to listen, to teach them to obey, and pr prepare them for when their time is to lead. So yes, if you're a parent, your primary responsibility is your own kids. But that's not your only responsibility. You see, sometimes we focus so much on our own kids that we forget about the other children that God has put in our way. That we're to reach out. Because guess what? Most children in our society right now are not being raised in Christian homes. Can I get an amen? Most kids that are growing up in America are being raised in a secular culture that is teaching them that God is neither not real or some far off being that has no interest in their life. We have a responsibility to invest in the children of a generation. Which means for you as a parent, you would be very well advised to invite other godly men and women into the lives of your own kids. That they might feed into your kids. Not taking away that primary responsibility of you to disciple your kids, but to invite them into a different perspective. Pastors, Sunday school teachers, life group leaders, inviting them into your own world. But then also looking around you at your kids' friends that come over. Is there a place at your table for them? Particularly those ones who don't have families that go to church or families that are actively teaching their children to follow Jesus. A lot of times in our world, our, you know, the world says, not my monkeys, not my circus. You know, I have a middle child that is crazy, and I know that a lot of times when some of you see her coming, you cringe. <laughs> and I know that sometimes, you know, we, we see kids in our world, and even today, you know, you think about, you know, there, there's babies crying in a worship service. But you know what? That's okay. In fact, that's great. And I know some of you are distracted, and I know that, that sometimes you're like, can't we just quiet the babies? But what would Jesus think? You see, they're the next generation. You see, whether or not you sit on that corner, that corner, up there, every single one of us is responsible for the next generation to raise them up, to teach them to listen to the Word of God, to have a high view of the Word of God, because guess what? The world outside these doors is going to teach them to have a low view of this book. To teach them to obey the Word of God. And can I just add, to teach them that they are welcome in the family of God, not just for what they will contribute down the road, but what they contribute now. Even the joy that we get in a couple weeks when we see them leading us in worship through a play, it's going to be awesome. And I think that in heaven, people are, the, the angels are celebrating our children. We are all called to lead the next generation to embrace Jesus. Now, it doesn't matter where you are on this spectrum. It doesn't matter if you are a terrible listener or a great listener. It doesn't matter if you've mastered the word of God and you are able to obey it with perfection. Or if you know that every now and again you slip, you fall, and you fail. Every one of us can lead someone. Does anybody know who Edward Kimball is? Edward Kimball, not the Harrison Ford character from The Fugitive. Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball is one of the most important men of the 19th century. He lived at the end of the 1800s. He was a Sunday school teacher. And he was responsible for teenage boys, God bless his heart. 
And he had this group of young men that he would disciple in Sunday school every Sunday. And he had such a heart for them that he would spend time just pouring into them. And he would spend hours praying over their souls because he had a desire that they would come to know Jesus with all of their heart. But he had one young man that was just a pain in his rear end. He was that young man that came and they would just sit there and would just chat with his friends, distract everybody else, make jokes, laugh. Just He was, had a, he was at his wit's end with this young man. So back then, this young man had a job. He was stocking shelves at a shoe store, and Edward Kimball was like, I'm going to go confront this man. In all love, he was going to go, and he was going to tell this young man, you have a choice. You can continue going down the road that you are going that leads to darkness, to regret, or you can embrace the love of a Savior that has so much more for you. Now, see, there's where I think a lot of us, we kind of, we fail. You see, when we see that young man that is distracting, we go to him and say, stop it, or else you're not welcome here. Edward Kimball had a heart full of love that offered him a, a different path. And this young man prayed to receive Christ that morning, and forever his life was changed. You may know who this young man is. His name was D.L. Moody. He was one of the greatest evangelists of the late 1800s. He led thousands to Christ over two continents. And there's a Bible college in Chicago named after him, the, Bible, the Moody Bible Institute. He's a great man of God, but the, the story doesn't end there. D.L. Moody led another man to faith who also became a great evangelist. His name was Wilbur Chapman. And this man led another person to Christ, a professional baseball player, then turned evangelist named Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday was a great evangelist. He did, he's kind of one of those people that carried on the, the great tent meetings of the early 1900s. He was a great musician and led thousands of people to Christ. And one of those people he led to Christ was a man named Mordecai Ham. And Mordecai Ham worked with Billy Sunday for many years before Billy Sunday went on to become a pastor of a local church. And then Mordecai Ham carried on these tent meetings around the country. And then on a night in North Carolina, Mordecai Ham was speaking, and in the audience was a young man who, when Mordecai Ham said, does anybody want to come forward and embrace Christ as their Savior, this young man came forward and gave his life to the Lord. And his name was Billy Graham. You see, so often we think that we can't do anything. We can't lead anybody. But you see, Edward Kimball, who you've probably never heard of until this day, you may never hear of again, was obedient to God's word, had a love for the next generation in such a real and profound way that he was just obedient to what God put before him. And even if it was just D.L. Moody that he led to the Lord, and that was the end of the story, thousands would have come to know Jesus through the ministry of Edward Kimball. But many, many years, and we have somebody like Billy Graham in the spiritual lineage. The reality is, is that many of us won't ever do great things. We won't write great books. We won't lead great revivals. We won't have thousand-member churches. For us, Maybe the greatest contribution we'll make to the family of God and the kingdom of God is somebody who we lead to Jesus. So as we reflect this morning, I just want to ask you this. Who are you leading? Who are you leading? We all can lead somebody. Maybe it is your kids. But is there room for somebody else in your life to lead them? Lead them closer to Jesus. Lead them to pursue Jesus, to listen to your instructions, to learn to obey the word of God. But then are we raising up those people to lead others? That when we, when our time has come to step down from leadership, that we know that the next generation is in good hands because we played a part in leading them closer to Jesus. So as we spend time reflecting, uh, who are you leading? And maybe this is a time for you to decide that you are going to lead somebody. Maybe there's somebody that you know of that needs some help 
that you can say, hey, can I have coffee with you? Part of being a good leader is first being a good follower. Maybe for, for some of us, we need to take a step back and say, I need somebody to lead me. And asking an older, more mature Christian, can you help me? Can you sit with me? Can you read these words with me? Can you teach me to obey them like you have? Let's spend some time reflecting. And as Josh plays... Ask yourself, who am I leading? Who can I lead? And maybe who can lead me? Let's spend some time reflecting. Thanks for watching. I hope this message encourages you as you love God, serve others, and change the world. Check us out on our website, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. God bless.